Hi everyone, we had the absolute pleasure to welcome Jean-Claude Beaver in Brussels. He flew in to talk to us about how he's doing, what he's doing and to share his unique perspectives. The man is simply unequaled in today's watch industry. Please enjoy this fantastic interview with Mr. Jean-Claude Beaver. One day I will come with my wife and then we will, and then we will eat uh, Pommes frites, you know, how do you say that? Uh, French fries. Moule. Huh? Moule. Yeah, moule and French fries. I love French fries and I love moule. I think uh, I'm passionate about life. Yes. Salesman. Yeah. Ich bin kein Salesman. Yeah, this is uh, Patek Philippe, reference 5070 in white, white gold. It's a watch I love. You can see the bracelet. There's a lot of traces of <laughs> uh, because I wear it quite often. And here I have a Rolex <laughs> Daytona Rainbow. And my wife tells me, oh, this is not for you. I say, yes, I understand. It's not for me, but I like it. And <laughs> It's not for me, but as I like it, I wear it. Because I love, yeah, I, I wear watches with my heart. Um, but which watch do you wear the most, Mr. Beaver, if you wear two watches? Number one, I don't wear always two watches. Usually I wear one. And uh, number two, I love this Patek. But I also love the watch that helped me the most. It's the Bigger Bang All Black from Hublot. This watch I have started to wear it in 2005. And honestly, I think till I became ill, I have been wearing this watch 90% of the time. And this watch is my lucky watch. When I wear it, this watch has brought me so much luck, so much happiness, so much success that I will never be able uh, not to have it close to me. It's like my bag. I have a bag that I have since 1982 and this bag has done all my career. Yeah, it's there. The bag uh, went through all my career. And this bag, one day I want to give to one of my child to say, voila, put your files in this bag this bag is the bag that will bring you success. Or put this watch on, this watch, the bigger bang, all black from Hublot, will bring you success. I see myself as somebody who has understood that to be strong, to be successful, I need around myself a lot a hell of a lot of help as i believe that i need help i also have understood that help should come from people that are better than me which means i have people around myself the oldest person has been with me since 49 the latest person has joined me at Omega in 96. And all these people have been with me since 79 and the other one since 96. And they have given me extraordinary help. And when you get a lot of help, uh, there is suddenly a momentum that starts. And this momentum is like uh, an avalanche in the snow it gets bigger and bigger and bigger can you imagine that I have worked on five brands and the person from 79 has joined me has followed me in these five brands some have followed me only in three because some are young they started in 96 but nevertheless this team and that is what I say to the students never forget 
if you want to become strong, be surrounded by stronger people than yourself. Because if you are the best and you are the strongest, how can they help? They can only help if they are better than you. And very few people dare being surrounded by better people than themselves. Because they want to be the boss. They want to say, I know. They want to give instructions and order. So that is an enormous difference between me being an entrepreneur and many, many others. And I teach students, never forget to be surrounded by better people than you. Yes, but then how can I be the boss? Hey, careful. If I am a conductor, orchestra, and I have the best piano player, the best violin player, the best violin, it doesn't mean, because they all play better than me, that I cannot conduct these people. <laughs> so, uh, I have played the role of a conductor. I have also helped my people. You know, when I see the CEO of Hublot today, when I gave him the position in 2012, he had started with me in 1986 as a logistic junior, taking the car and going to collect uh, dials or hands or crowns. And slowly, slowly, he has grown up. But he has grown up because we have helped him. He has also grown up because of his own capacities, of course. But he got help. When you think that the CEO of, uh, of uh, Rolex is even today one of my three best friends, but he has been 12 years with me. Uh, I was his mentor. And this is also a role that I have played. I'm the mentor of people. Uh, <clears throat> then, that's probably half of my success, or 60%. And then the other 20% of my success is luck. Because luck is something that you meet when you move. Luck is like a, a hair uh, that is from the top. Uh, uh, so there are many hairs that you cannot see. Invisible hairs that you cannot see. If you don't move, you cannot touch them. If you move, Suddenly, because you don't see, you touch one. Ah! And then luck comes. And you move again, boom! Luck comes. So luck is the consequence of activity, of moving. Luck is also the consequence of behavior. Moral behavior, ethical behavior. Uh, honest, authentic. Boom, boom, boom. And then luck comes. And the rest is hard work. So you see? Uh, I believe in the, in the club, I believe in people, and together we are stronger than alone. And together we don't feel being alone. So I'm not a lonely guy. I am a man of a community. I have lived, when I was a hippie, uh, during four years in a commune, and I have never lost this mentality. And in a commune, you share. In a commune, you respect. And even in a commune, you forgive mistakes. So, if in business, if with your team, if you share, what do you share? We share success. Ah, oh, okay, everybody shares success. All right, but we share mistakes. Ah, uh -huh. we share visions. We share experience, we share knowledge, we share doubts. If you share on a larger scale, you make people confident, you give security. Ah, oh, the boss has shared his mistakes. He has accepted, he said he did this and this wrong. You see? So the sharing is an important element. Then, if you respect people, you respect that not everybody is like you. It's not because I get up at 3 o'clock in the morning that I want everybody to get up at 3. I respect. If you respect women, 
How did we respect women at Duglo, for instance? We respected women by building, when we built the new factory, we have built a kindergarten. And we had not one child from Üblo. Oh, in the beginning, all the kids that were in the kindergarten came from somewhere in the, in the village or in the county. Because we had only 42 women working at that time, and we didn't have, they didn't have kids. Oh, yeah, they had kids that were uh, at all, other had uh, no kids, and other had kids that already went into a certain kindergarten. But I said, it doesn't matter. We're going to build 500 square meters kindergarten. And if this kindergarten is empty for a few, one year or two years, who cares? But one day it will be full. So this it means I respect women. It's not that I give the same salary to men and women for the same job. That's normal. But I respect women because I act, understand that they have obligations because of the children that are not similar to men. So I build a kindergarten. So you see, the respect gives also put everybody at ease. And last but not least, if you forgive mistakes and you say to the people, this mistake, I'm happy you did it, because now you have learned and you will never do it again. So the mistake makes you rich, rich in experience, rich in knowledge. It doesn't make you rich if you repeat the mistake. Then it makes you poor and <laughs> stupid. But, uh, so imagine a community that is driven by this mentality, which I just mentioned now. Wow, that can only, that can only end up in a success. So that's why I am successful. And that is probably my role. My role is to be a leader, my role is to be a mentor, my role is to be an example, uh, my role is to be a motivator, my role is to be a visionary, and my role is to share. That's what I am. You know, <clears throat> I wanted to work uh, till I am uh, 80. And when I was 69, 68 and a few months, uh, yeah, nearly 69, I got ill. It's the first time I got ill in my life. I'm not used to, to uh, get it. And uh, because it was lasting, because I had to take 18 months cortisone and some chemotherapy, it helped me uh, to get wise or wiser. And in that moment, and when I was in hospital, I said to the doctor, you know, thanks God I'm sick. He said, what do you say? I said, thanks God I'm sick. God is helping me. He's putting me in hospital because he has a message to tell me. And the message is, Beaver son, your body is some, your body needs respect. You cannot use your body anymore as you used it. You know, I was telling my body at 3 o'clock in the morning, or 2.30, GET UP! And the body says, fucking shit! I have to get up? YES, YOU GET UP! And then the body was say, get up? Then he said, okay, what I'm doing now? Go to the kitchen, make coffee please. And the body goes down, da 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 He makes coffee. Boss, the coffee is done. What do I do? Go to the office. Put the computer on. And the party goes to the office, puts the computer on, and then I come. I say, okay, thank you. Then I drink my coffee and I work. And the body is there. He is just doing what I want. Traveling to Tokyo, going to Tokyo, working 10 hours, same flight back, going to LA, you know, I go Tokyo, LA, Hong Kong, New York, never sleep in hotel, boom, boom, same flight. Um, but I work 12 hours, 
non-stop till midnight or two o'clock in the morning and then at, at six back to the to the to the airport and next flight back. All this <laughs> has been possible because the body was just following and had strong body. Now suddenly God said we must talk to Beaver. Let him okay I, I take care. Inject him some illness <laughs> Uh, and I reacted. I reacted by learning that the body needs respect. But I also learned that when you are close to 70, you are entering the last 20 years of your life. The last. And should the last 20 years be a copy of the first 20 years or of the second 20 years, no! The last 20 years must be different. And how different must they be? They must be different because the last 20 years are there in order to give back. Because if you continue to do just for yourself and you don't give back, your life, your life will be an egoistic life and it will help nobody. So you should devote the last 20 years in giving back. But you cannot give back when you drive. You, can, you must sit on another seat of the car, but not on the driver's seat. Uh, and that was my decision, okay, I'm doing it now. I wanted to start when I was 80, I started, I will start, I started 10 years earlier than it was foreseen. Now, how is it to sit in the, in the uh, I think it's very motivating because there is a huge pleasure in giving back. And now I have a son, uh, I have uh, three sons, I have five kids. But I have a son who is the youngest, he's now 19 years old. He is extremely obsessed, eaten by his passion for watches, mainly vintage watches. And he is telling me, Papa, we should make a brand together. It's time and I want to do that with you. If he wants to do it with me, maybe I will do. Why? Because I want to teach him. I want to help him. I... Okay, why didn't you that? Why didn't you do it with the other children? Because it was so early. My oldest son is 40. But 20 years ago, I was still doing. I was not thinking to give back. You cannot give back before you have done. <laughs> you must first do, and then you can give back. You must first have experience before you give back. Because what can you give back if you have no experience? Nothing. So, uh, it might be possible that one day I'm doing a brand that we can call whatever, or even Beaver brand, Beaver and Sun, uh, and that this brand, the motivation would be to finish my career with some dreams and some desires and some visions which I still have, and to bring my family, my kids, and to help them uh, to yeah, to develop something, but we'll see. Okay, so because you as a person now within the watch industry, you are not just you know an employee or, or a boss anymore. You have become a brand already. So <laughs> the bigger brand exists. This is this is you, and you stand for certain things. Yep. Uh, so the only thing we discussed this yesterday uh, at dinner. Do you really think I am a brand? My name is a brand. You are absolutely a brand if you ask me. And, and with a certain, you know, you, because you... First time I hear that. That is my, my opinion. Wow. Yeah. And the only thing that we're missing, uh, you know, many watch brands will buy a brand, buy a name uh, and yep. then develop it. You already have the brand, we just don't have the wristwatch. Yes. Yet. And then, you know, we perfectly within this context of giving back and mentoring the next generation. Yes. You know, why not do that then by building up a brand? And then we were also thinking, where would you actually position the potential uh, Beaver brand? Of yes. I don't oh. know if you're giving that some time. I would position it at the top of the top. At 
the end, you know, it must be a no excuse, bro. No excuse. It means everything. Nobody can give any uh, remark that we haven't done. Oh, the screws. Every screw is double polished. Oh, this. Bam. A no excuse, bro. And if you do no excuse, and you master the invisible visibility. You master what people cannot see. Because that's the real art. The art is not to, to, to master what people can see. That is obvious. But it's to master what people cannot see. Like in the past. In the past, under the dial, the movement was extraordinarily finished and engraved of a beauty that is... In, so, with the industry, people said, but why should we do a decoration under the dial? They're going to put anyhow a dial on it. But in the past, watchmakers were decorating under the dial for many reasons. Number one, it belonged to the art. But the second reason was also, as every watch had the name of the watchmaker that made it, you know, even uh, uh, on, on big brands, there it was always a little sign. Our first Blanca watches, every watchmaker had a sign, a kind of logo, so you could trace. Ah, he has put his name. Who is that? Ah, so this is Charles André Piguet. Ah, yeah. Oh, he has done the watch. So these watchmakers, they said, if I don't decorate my movement under the dial, and one day in 20 years, a watchmaker has to repair. And he takes the dial off, and he see no decoration, and then he see the little logo of Charles André, and then this watchmaker would say, "Oh fuck! You see, this was done by Charles André Piguet, but he has not decorated." <laughs> so, for that only reason, in the past they were decorating everything. So that no watchmaker, when he repair, can say, oh, Charles André was not a good one. <laughs> you see, this is what I call the invisible visibility. You must master the invisible visibility. If you do that, you are, there is no limit in the quality. Then you are at the top, then you are at um, Mount Everest, but no space, winter time, and alone. Wow! <laughs> so many people went to Everest, but nobody went alone. Nobody went in the, in the north face <laughs> and in winter time. And that is probably what I gotta do. If I will go now to the Everest, a thousand people have gone to the Everest with Sherpa, <laughs> oxygen. No, that I, that, is, that I don't want. I've done already. I've done, I've been five times at the Everest. But alone, no space, winter, nobody has ever. So if I do a brand, that is what I will have to do. And if you do that, you are, you are expensive. <laughs> because it costs money. And if every screw costs 50 Swiss francs to finish it, and to do the right angle and the right polishing, and you have 77 screws. That's 3,500 Swiss francs just for screws. <laughs> and you have only screws. So you see, uh, the price of the extreme is ex can be extremely expensive. And that would be my destiny, to finish at the top. Voilà. Am I correct in sensing that you're actively thinking about it now and or working yes, on it? Or no, or no, I, I'm thinking about it because you were as, asking the question. Uh, you know, I have um, I have a, a relation with uh, LVMH and with Mr. Arno, and I'm still working. Uh, okay, I still have. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm working full time, so I have not much time to think about it. But 
you know, from time to time, as now in the interview, you ask questions and I give answers. And this slowly, slowly is building up. And as I said, maybe I will do it, maybe not. And, but if I do, I will go to the top. But do I work on it actively? No. Do I play with the idea? Yes. But before doing, you must think about it. Yes. So, I'm playing with the idea. Yes, no, how, blah, blah, you know, what would be my desire, what is my next vision for watches, all these questions I'm asking this, my questions, but I haven't given any answer yet. All right, that's it for part one. Please make sure to also check part two of the interview where Mr. Beaver talks about the Swiss watch industry, the challenges in the watch industry, how he would lead a brand like Rolex and so much more. If you like this content, please let us know, click like and possibly even subscribe.